Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Kate Williams and today I'm going to be talking to you about recent advances in the creation of low methane emitting ruminants using a genetic approach. This short CPD lecture will feature a small introduction to the topic and the rationale behind breeding low methane emitting animals. I'll then look at the case of sheep and then at the more substantial body of research available on cows. Hopefully by the end of this lecture you'll be right up to date on the most recent advance in the area and you'll be able to form your own opinion on the feasibility of breeding low methane emitting ruminants. First I'd like to give you a bit of context for the presentation, although I know you're probably all awfully familiar with these sorts of statistics. So we all know that methane is a very potent greenhouse gas or GHG. It has a climate change potential 32 times greater than carbon dioxide and an atmospheric half-life of 12 years, which is also much shorter than CO2 by about 100 years. These two facts make methane a very attractive target for mitigation as there's potential to see significant results in a relatively short time period. Reducing methane emissions from anthropogenic or human related sources have been identified as a key area for mitigating climate change. This category includes emissions from agriculture and indeed livestock. Livestock alone account for 14.5% of anthropogenic GHG emissions and enteric methane from ruminants specifically accounts for about 5.8%. Thanks to human population expansion, the demand for animal products like meat and milk is no doubt going to soar in the coming years, which will have a knock-on effect on these emissions from livestock. So the message is quite clear, we need to reduce methane emissions. But this is tricky because methanogenesis, or the production of methane, is a natural process that occurs in the rumen and indeed many other environments. In the rumen, it's this process that prevents the build-up of potentially poisonous hydrogen gas by incorporating it into methane. So for this reason, it's not as simple as just stopping methanogenesis altogether. So let's have a look at the process of methanogenesis in the rumen. First of all, the animal ingests food, mostly plant material, which travels through to the rumen and is broken down by fungi, protozoa and bacteria, all of whom produce hydrogen, carbon dioxide and an array of volatile fatty acids, or VFAs, which can then be used by the methanogenic archaea and bacteria to produce methane. The energy generated in the production of acetate and other VFAs in particular is used to generate CO2. Butyrate does play a role, but is mostly absorbed by the rumen wall, so you won't find reference to butyrate so much um, when we're talking about methane emissions. The cow then belches out the vast majority of methane, with a small amount coming out the other end, alongside some carbon dioxide. When we talk about methane emissions and their intensity, there are three key interconnecting factors that come into play. We know that the rumen microbiome is heavily influenced by diet, but it's also influenced by the host animal, which can in fact select species using the immune response and rumen pH via the saliva, as well as in hormonal regulation. Host genetics um, and diet are loosely linked in that the host genotype influences the microbiome and therefore has a proxy effect on methane production as well as other traits like feed efficiency. Research suggests that diet actually has an additive effect in terms of methane production in that methane emissions can be reduced even further in an animal that already has a low methane emitting rumen type and genotype by feeding the appropriate diet. So when we look at research investigating low methane emitting ruminants, we can see that it's divided between sheep and cattle. This is because whilst they have the same digestive system, albeit scaled up or scaled down, there are still differences in their biology. We also tend to find that there's a lot more research available on methane mitigation in cattle, simply because they have a larger target on their back. Whilst the average sheep produces approximately 30 litres of methane a day, a dairy cow will produce 200. Add to this the fact that sheep often graze poor quality, marginal land and are not as intensively produced as cattle, there's less of an opportunity to make a splash reducing methane emissions from sheep. So there is still research available um, into low methane emitting sheep and first of all I'd like to take a look at this. It seems a combination of morphology, that is a small rumen with a short retention time, and the bacterial population structure are responsible for these low methane emitting animals. This short retention time in a smaller chamber in conjunction with specific bacterial species 
lends itself to fast fermentation, which produces more lactate than the other VFAs, acetate, butyrate or propionate. And lactate offers little to no hydrogen for incorporation into methane, essentially nipping the problem in the bud and acting as like a hydrogen sink. This research covers bacterial population structure in the sheep rumen, but has not yet addressed the methanogenic archaea. However, when we look at the abundance of the archaea, where we would expect to see more archaea, meaning more methane, instead we see very little correlation with methane production. What we do see is a similar story to that of the bacteria, in that certain species are associated with low methane yields and others with high methane yields. Also, upregulation of these genes used in methane production by these microbes act as a pretty good indicator of how much methane the animal is going to produce. These differences may make it possible to um, identify a low or high methane emitting animal based on what is present and what's not in the rumen microbiome. And that's an interesting concept that we're going to hear more about later on in terms of cows. The heritability of overall methane emissions in sheep is moderate at 0.29 and unlike in cattle it would appear that methane production is not actually linked to production traits in sheep. It seems likely that the majority of this heritability comes from rumen size as this does have a genetic basis. Meanwhile the rumen microbiome is dictated by the mother and the herd so when a lamb is sold and moved this can significantly alter the microbiome. The lamb will pick up slightly different microbes from its new herd and the microbiome will subtly change to mirror that of the surrounding animals and adapt to whatever diet it's given. So whilst a lamb might inherit a low methane emitted microbiome from the ewe and its original herd, this might be subject to change once it's sold and might not retain those low methane emissions from the microbiome. Again, this is a lot of maize and mites and it's something that could do with a bit further research. If the heritability value of 0.29 can be replicated, then it seems like there might be a little bit of scope to breed low methane emitting sheep. So next, I'd like to look at the research produced using cows, um, most of which is based on beef breeds. It's no surprise that the rumen microbiome plays a key role in the amount of methane a cow produces. It's been demonstrated that individuals produce different levels despite identical diets and management systems. And this could be due to host genetics, or it could be due to the microbiome, or more than likely, it's due to a combination of both these factors. Because the process of methanogenesis is complex and involves many different organisms performing different processes, this means that there's a lot of different things that might affect total methane output. If you remember that diagram we saw earlier showing the three key aspects that dictate methane production, diet, room and microbiome, and host animal genetics, just remember that there's an awful lot of smaller factors that all tie into each of these aspects to make it a bit more complex. So as we already mentioned, a great deal of the rumen microbiome is inherited and the heritability of this part of the microbiome specifically associated with methane emissions varies from 36 to 53%, meaning that selective breed breeding strategies focused on the microbiome only would likely be highly effective. A few recent studies have looked at the microbial basis for methane emissions in great detail using deep or next generation sequencing um, to narrow it down, right down to the gene level. This sort of detail and data is only possible with these newer sequencing methods which are really opening up a whole new world for the human microbiome. Enhancing our knowledge and understanding is of course essential as we can work from the gene level upwards to then design ideas for mitigation methods or breathing strategies. We spoke previously about the process of methanogenesis, so remember that all microbes in the rumen produce precursory hydrogen and carbon for methane, but only methanogenic archaea and to a lesser extent methanogenic bacteria actually create methane. The genus Methanobrevibacter from Archaea is well known for its methanogenic activity and it's been found in abundance in the rumen of high methane emitting cows. In fact, it dominates this population of rumen Archaea along with a couple of other heavy hitters in uh, high methane animals. Low emitters actually possess similar species but in a very different abundance, with their Archaeal populations being dominated by species that actually utilise methane rather than making it. In fact, studies have found that low methane emitters possess a more diverse population of archaea 
which might actually contribute to overall room stability and health. The big question, of course, is how is this community determined? Could it be genetic or could it be affected by diet? And most importantly, can we manipulate this to our advantage? Here, further research is needed to look at that selection of the room and microbiome and how we might influence that, as I say, to our own advantage to increase things like feed efficiency whilst also reducing uh, methane emissions. The other side of the story um, from the rumen microbiome and an equally as important side is that of the rumen bacteria, which like in sheep also have a significant effect on methane production. As a result of fermentation, bacteria in particular produce a lot of VFAs along with hydrogen and CO2, which are vital for methane production. But different fermentation products arise from different bacteria. And we see here succina vibriona sica producing succinate, as the name suggests, and some lactate as the main fermentation product, as opposed to volatile fatty acids. We already know that lactate, and now we know succinate, traps hydrogen rather than releasing it as gas for incorporation into methane. And this contributes really significantly to reducing methane emissions. Because we've been able to connect the rumen microbiome and host genetics and jointly link them to methane, this means that there's a really good likelihood that we could breed low methane emission animals. Research has shown that immune molecules circulating in the saliva flow through to the rumen and act to deplete some specific bacterial taxa and enhance others. The implications of this sort of selection are significant. What triggers selection? Are there different selection processes? How does feed and animal health and physiological status affect this? And as we've said before, how could we use this selection process and manipulate it to our advantage to encourage a low methane emitting microbiome? Our current understanding strengthens this link between the host and the microbiome and the role of the host in affecting the microbial composition. But a little bit further research would certainly go a long way in terms of manipulation of this selection. Just going back to um, breeding strategies, it's important to remember that this must be approached with a little bit of caution and sight shouldn't be lost of other key traits like those involved in productivity or health and fertility, for example. It's excellent news then that some innovative and exciting research published in 2017 and 18 showed that both improvement in feed conversion efficiency and mitigation of methane emissions is achievable through breeding. Such strategies can be informed using information from the rumen microbiome and their genes, as well as the host genotype. Of course, there are other factors that influence methane emissions. I am focusing on just these two aspects here, and we haven't talked a lot about diet. Another thing we haven't talked about much about is um, temperament and dominance within the herd. Recent studies have found that cattle at the top of the hierarchy are able to eat more frequently and for longer than those towards the bottom. These more frequent intakes result in lower methane emissions, so more dominant cattle tend to have less emissions. Ensuring adequate space at the trough might help cattle lower down in the hierarchy to maintain their dry matter intakes and potentially reduce methane emissions whilst also maintaining those growth rates. Just having a look at the sort of diagnosis and identification um, of methane emissions, we, use, we tend to use proxies for this and many different proxies have been investigated for predicting methane emissions. So for example, body, body weight, um, milk and thread spectroscopy and rumen morphology. But these proxies aren't always easy or convenient to use and the ones that we've already looked at have been quite inaccurate even when we combine them together. So it was really important to find a proxy measurement for methane that is easy to carry out, that's affordable, and most of all is accurate. So a study in 2014 did just that. They looked at the microbial profile of digester from beef cattle and found that microbial abundances were a pretty good indicator for methane emissions. By themselves, archaea and bacterial abundances didn't have a particularly strong correlation with levels of methane. However, the abundance of protozoa did have a strong connection. This is because certain types of protozoa, the holotrichs, preferably digest starch, which gives rise to hydrogen. So they're often archaeal methanogens associated with the surface of these protozoa or clustered around them just waiting for that hydrogen to be released. 
The study then found that the archaea to bacterial ratio was actually an even better indicator of methane emissions, and it was accurate in both life and at post-mortem. But the correlations with methane emissions were affected by diet. And this study used um, a couple of different diets, ranging from a high concentrate to a forage-based and low concentrate diet. The trend between emissions and um, archaea to bacterial ratio was really good, really strong when using a um, concentrate-based diet. But on the forage-based diet, these correlations petered out and actually became non-significant. So a more recent study published in 2018 looked at genes from the rumen microbiome as biomarkers to indicate uh, methane emissions instead. This study again used several different breeds on several different diets to establish if there was any effect on the reliability or robustness of these markers. There was a very strong correlation between genes involved in methane production and methane emissions. Just as you'd expect, the more abundant these genes are, the more methane the animal will emit. Nice and straightforward. And these markers were reliable and consistent in different breeds and diets. Even better, you'll remember, is that these microbes and their genes are highly heritable at a rate of between 36 and 53%. So this ties in really nicely with potential selective breeding strategies to produce these low methane emitting cows. Another concept that seems kind of obvious, but was as yet unproved, is the relationship between genes involved in the breakdown and utilisation of methane as an energy source and the emissions released. The more of these genes indicates more microorganisms capable of utilising methane and this directly translates to less methane emissions. This study based in SRUC was also able to do the same with feed efficiency, allocating 20 robust microbial marker genes um, as well as for growth rates and dry matter intake. Um, authors expect to be able to extend this to animal health. So in addition to breeding for low methane emitting cows, we could also end up with a more efficient productive and potentially healthier animal too. So currently this information is being worked into a practical sort of on-farm solution to inform breeding strategies. But there are still a few hurdles to overcome because this sort of strategy is in its infancy. While this method is cheap compared to the super accurate laboratory measurements of emissions using a respiration chamber, how does it compare price-wise to other methods um, used to inform selective breeding strategies that we use at the moment? Current plans are to incorporate these genes into a micro array chip. You can see um, a representative of this on screen here, where each dot represents a different gene involved in our trait of interest here, methane emissions or maybe feed efficiency. And the color or light intensity indicates the abundance of this gene. This will take time and money to develop. And as such a starting price on something like this, would likely be higher than that of um, genome screening, for example, commonly used in dairy cows. However, it seems likely as time goes on and the method becomes more common, as with all things, the price will decrease and it will become a more economic strategy. The largest stumbling block, in my opinion, is taking samples because collecting rumen fluid or digester can be invasive. Um, under experimental conditions, animals may be fistulated Obviously, this will never be the case for farm animals, or they might have a nasogastric tube, um, a stomach tube inserted. The insertion of a stomach tube can be quite stressful, again, invasive and time consuming for the operator, especially in large subadult cows as opposed to calves, which are obviously smaller and easier to handle. On the other hand, it seems likely that this would only need to be done once in an animal's life, so it's a case of weighing up those pros and cons. So to finish the presentation, I'd just like to give you a few take home messages. From my perspective, it seems likely that it's only a matter of time before we begin selective breeding for low methane emissions, along with a whole host of other traits like feed efficiency that could tie into producing a more efficient and environmentally friendly animal using genetic and microbial indicators. There's certainly scope to breed cows, beef and dairy alike for low methane emissions, although it's worth considering that the majority of the research I've spoken about here was carried out in beef cattle. Again, maybe a bit less scope to breed low methane emission uh, sheep, and again, less pressure to do so. In the meantime, it might be useful for producers to look at diet 
which has a very significant effect on methane emissions and the effects of which, remember, are additive to rumen type and genotype. So thank you for listening to this short lecture today and I hope you found it as interesting and informative as I have.